Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening. Depends on where you're located. Welcome to this real, real estate investing seminar by Trust Your Talent Academy. My name is Stephen Chung. I'll be your trainer today. I, I see some familiar faces today. Welcome you all. Now, to maximize your return today, please make sure that you have your camera on. I see that some of you have your camera on. Thank you, Dave and Diane, Mitch, and Edric, John, Miranda and Benny, hello. Thank you, Aaron, Samma. Wow, you guys are really listening to my instruction. Well done, good for you. <clears throat> because even though this is an online Zoom event, it is still a live event, which means everything is happening in real time. So I like your instant feedback and interaction. That's great. Turn on your camera so that for me and other participants can see you. And here's the main reason why when I can see you, whether you are nodding or putting up your hands and laughing or even falling asleep, this will give me instant feedback on what kind of content and information that you are interested in so that I can tailor made to give you more or less depending on your reaction. So if we, if we don't see you, there's no way we can tell. So turn on your camera. The other thing is participation. Like when I ask a question, and if that question applies to you, please raise your hand. And raise your hand up high and even wave so that I can see you. Don't do a dinosaur T-Rex hand, because right now for you on my screen is like that tiny little box there on this side. So when I'm looking at this side, I am looking at you. So if you have a question, make sure you wave so that I could see that. And uh, now, as I said earlier, I want you to turn on your camera so that you could give me more energy. So let's practice this together. By a show of hand, who is here right now? By a show of hand, who is here right now? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. It also means that you understand my Chinglish, which is very, very important. And when I ask a question, if that, uh, and if you know the answer, feel free to unmute yourself and answer. If you have a question, ask any time. But if you're not speaking, please mute your mic so that the background noise won't disturb others. You could also type in your questions and comments in the chat. However, sometimes I'm busy talking and haven't got to your questions in the chat yet. Don't worry, the coaches with us today, Mike, and uh, he will be helping me to answering some of your questions in the chat too. <clears throat> John says, your English is exceptional. Oh, thank you, John. <laughs> thank you. Now, this real estate seminar will have tons of great knowledge. Make sure you have your pen and paper ready to take notes. Also, get your calculator and cell phone ready because you will be asked to do some calculations and even a deal analysis. Yes, you need to work. If you just sit there and you're not going to learn and retain much knowledge. So we have to dive right into it. Now, for those who don't know me, uh, here's a little, little bit brief introduction of me. Once again, my name is Stephen Chung. My parents used to work for the Hong Kong government, and I, I was born in Hong Kong. So my parents used to work for the Hong Kong government for their whole life for 40 years. So they're always in that employee mindset. By the time when they retired, they never actually owned the house that they live in. I'm like, wow, you work so hard, and at the end, there's nothing for you to show for. Do I really want to follow that path? Not so much. At the age of 16, I moved to a very little town in Canada called Vancouver. Has anyone heard of it? Yes, yes. I'm sure John knows where that is. <laughs> yes, yes. John is also in the Greater Vancouver area as well. So I've been living in Vancouver, Canada for over 30 years. And uh, I went to University of British Columbia and studied electrical and computer engineering. After I graduated, I started my own computer and IT business. Now, as a small business owner, of course, I work really, really hard. And eventually, I have two, biz, uh, two retail st stores and 20 staff working for me. 
So business went well, and I do make some decent income from my small business. But as a small business owner, I had one pain. The pain was I didn't have time. I didn't have time to do what I want in life, that is spend time with my family or traveling around the world. I couldn't do it. That's why back in 2014, I came to learn more about real estate. I came to one of these like real estate investing seminar, wanting to learn how to invest in properties. Now, back in 2014, I did own my own house, the house that I live in, but I never actually own any investment properties. By investment properties, I mean the house that you own, but you don't live inside. You rent it out to get some rental income. At that time, I didn't have any investment properties. At that time, I worked hard for money. Now I really want to learn how money works hard for me. So that's why I came to this real estate investing seminar, wanting to learn more. And I was blown away by different strategies that I learned. And then after that, I decided to invest thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars in my own education to learn more about real estate investing and have a mentor to help me. So let's fast forward the time frame. I told you that back in 2014, I did not have any investment properties. So after the real estate investing seminar, after I took some advanced training and with the help of my mentor, I started to invest in properties. I started to buy properties first in British Columbia. Then I continue to expand my territories to other provinces in Canada, all the way to New Brunswick. So I own numerous properties across Canada. Then I started to expand my territory again. I started to invest in the US as well as in the UK. So within a few years time frame, with the help of my mentor and education and the action I took, I become financially free. And these are just some of the properties that I bought over the years, just some, not even all. Without the right education and action that I took nine years ago, there's no way I would even know how to get started. That's why I'm forever grateful for the actions that I took and what my mentors and coaches and instructors have taught me over the years, how to invest in properties to achieve my financial freedom. And that's why today I'm here to share my knowledge. And at the same time, I will invite all of you to take action, take control and take ownership to start changing your life. And the team who is with me this weekend or uh, today also sat in these seats some point in the past. Mike, let me ask you, when did you take one of these real estate investing seminars before? So it was in fact in 2018 in Calgary, Alberta, downtown. It was live, obviously Zoom was even a thing back then. So it was a live setting, but yeah, very similar to this. So five years ago. Amazing, amazing. As you can see, we all come from the product of the same system. My trainer told me that you do exactly what you're supposed to do and you will get exactly where you want to be. So today is not about me, it's all about you. I have told you the reason why I'm here. Now I want to know why are you here? Why have you decided to spend a couple hours of your day to come to this seminar? What is the purpose and what would you like to learn? So who would like to be my victim? I mean volunteer, volunteer. You see my English level is just ESL. So and how I can invest in real estate, right? So, so who would like to volunteer to tell me what would you like to learn today? Anyone? John, unmute yourself. Happy to be a victim, Stephen. So, because I know where you live. So just, to, <laughs> I don't technically know, but I'm sure I can find out. Yes. Um, hi everyone, my name is John. As Stephen said, I live in uh, Vancouver with my wife, Candy, and our son, um, just actually in Burnaby outside Vancouver. Um, so I am, uh, we are here, we, we joined TYT just in August most recently, so we're still relatively new members. Um, we are uh, aiming for financial freedom, obviously, and financial independence. Um, that said, 
uh, we don't necessarily know yet what our exact strategy is going to be. We've so far only done one course on lease options, rent to own. And mm -hmm. uh, that's been really interesting and intriguing for us. But I'm very, very interested in this particular topic as well. So just trying to learn about other strategies right now so we can sort of figure out what is the direction we want to be moving in. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your sharing. Yes, today's strategy is about income properties and multi-unit residential. And this strategy is known as that you could get massive passive income. So by a show of hands, who here would like to get massive passive income in the strategies? Absolutely. Now, for those newcomers, just join us in the seminar. Feel free to Turn on your camera so that we can all see you and participate. Thank you. So who and then one else would like to share why and why they're here and what they would like to learn today. We'll have one more victim, <laughs> Ted. Yes, mm -hmm. Ted. Hi, everyone. I'm Ted. I'm in uh, Oakville, Ontario. Um, uh, this is actually my second Zoom. And I went to a course uh, two weeks ago. Um, the more I find out stuff, the more I realize I don't know stuff. So I'm here to uh, find out what you know and try to implement that into my own, my own life and uh, build a team around me and learn from them as I go. Because I don't want to create the wheel. I just want to follow what you guys did. That's awesome. Thank you for your sharing. Yes, we want to share with you how we create a system. We need a system when we invest in real estate. Yes, Ted, of course, I met you in Toronto at the workshop there. And uh, and I'm really, really happy to see that you're here again with us today. Now, thanks for all who shared. This is our schedule for today. It's about two hours, give or take. And uh, this is what we're going to learn. Of course, we already know this is about income properties income properties. Now, by a show of hands, who here has never attended my bootcamp or workshop before? So turn on your camera and show me your hand, okay? Some of you have never attended my bootcamp uh, or workshop before. Well, welcome, welcome. So for those who have already attended one of my bootcamps or work workshops before, I just want to set an expectation. Now, today's seminar, it's a basic seminar. So I will cover some basic concepts of investing in income properties and multi-unit residential. By no means, this is an advanced course. So for those who have gone through my bootcamp or who have already taken some TYT advanced courses, you may find today's seminar is a little bit basic, but that's okay. Of course, you're welcome to stay here and learn treat it as a review for yourself, all right? This is the agenda. Investing for the fundamentals. Today, we will talk about some calculations because first of all, I want to bring everyone onto the same page, up to speed, because when we invest in real estate, of course, we need to do some math. Very important that we want to make sure that you know how to calculate those, those calculations. And we'll talk about the three steps and six rules in real estate investing. Income properties, that's the main topic, the reason why you're here today, to talk about multi-unit residential. When we deal with multi-unit residentials, before we even get into deals, there are some key performance indicators for us as an investors to really calculate, to make sure that it is a good deal before we move on to that project. So today we will share with you some deal showcase and even a live deal analysis. We'll do a live deal analysis together. And of course, we'll talk about what is your next step to achieve financial freedom and much, much more. So let's get started right away. First of all, let's talk about some business and investing fundamentals. As I said, I want to bring everyone up to speed onto the same page. So let's start with some simple formulas and calculations. If you want to be an investor, you don't have to be very good at math, but you need, you need to do some basic calculations. Don't worry. There are only three types of people in this world. Only three types. Those who can count 
and those who cannot. That's it. Three types of people, those who can count and those who cannot. Yes, as you can see, I'm not the, the smartest person in this room and I could invest in real estate. So can you. And there are several strategy coaches with us today and they are the smartest ones. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I see that Mike is here. Mike is one of the strategy coaches here at Trust Your Talent. So he will be supporting us today. Now, first equation, what is cash flow? For those who don't know, make sure that you write this down now. What is cash flow? Cash flow is basically monthly net profit. So think about it. Net profit is always income minus expenses. Income minus expenses give you your net profit. So when we're dealing with properties, what is the income? Well, typically it's the rent that we collected from our tenants. But do you keep all those income? Of course not. We have expenses to pay. And what are the, some of the expenses that you expect to pay when you own an investment properties? Anyone? What kind of expenses would you have to pay when you own an investment properties? Suzanne? Taxes. What's that, Suzanne? Taxes. Tax, correct. Maintenance. John, maintenance. maintenance. I'm sorry? So I hear tax, maintenance. Insurance. Insurance, okay. What else? Vacancy. Vacancy, yeah. Utility. What else? Utilities. Well, depending on what type of properties uh, we're talking about, some properties, the utilities get passed to the tenants. Tenants pay for that. But if you own typically like a, a larger multi-unit residential buildings, of course, we're going to talk about that, then maybe the common area utilities, yes, the landlord has to pay for that. I, I think that we're missing one major expense. I haven't heard just yet. Mortgage. Mortgage. Thank you. Mortgage payment. So that would be the one of the major expenses. Mortgage payment usually is principal and interest, P and I, tax, insurance. Now, in general, we call this the PD payments. P I T I, principal, interest, tax, and insurance, the PD payments. Plus, of course, there's repair and maintenance and management fee property management property management so when we when we minus all this together then it gives you your cash flow now let me ask you this does cash flow always have to be a positive number what do you think it should be if you're should be hand. john is like nodding the hand well put it this way we hope that it is a positive number. However, however, a lot of the uneducated investors, when they invest, sometimes they get this negative cash flow, meaning that the rent is not enough to cover all the expenses. Why is that? Well, and why is that all these people still buying this type of properties? Well, what they're doing is they're praying and hoping that the property will go up in value over time, five years, 10 years later, that the property will appreciate and then they will sell the property to make profits then. I'm like, wow, you have to wait how long? Like five, 10 years before you can make profit? That's too long, like 10 years. Like, I don't know about you, but I am 50 years old. So how many 10 years do I have in my lifetime? Hmm. Not that much, really. So I don't want to wait 10 years to make profit. I want to make money now from day one that I own the property. So what that means is when I buy a property, I want to make sure that the rent is enough to cover, cover all the expenses and I will have a positive cash flow. That type of investments then I will consider. And this positive cash flow, we call it passive income. Why? Well, because for those who still go to work, you earn an income and that's an active income because the minute that you stop working, you have no income. When we buy an investment properties and structure it correctly and getting a positive cash flow, well, 
Well, guess what? This money will come into my pocket every single month without me going to work or not. It doesn't really care. That's why it's called passive income. Now, while I enjoy this passive income every month, most likely the property will go up in value over time. Well, guess what? I don't care anymore because I don't depend on the property to go up to sell it later to make profit. No, because I am making profit from day one owning this property. And that's why positive cash flow is very, very important. So everyone, I need your participation. So type in the chat and say, I want positive cash flow. Go ahead and type in the chat. I want positive cash flow. Let me see if, if, oh yes, there you go. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Yes. I see the chat coming in. Oh, everyone love positive cash flow. That's awesome. Here is another equation. What is gross rental yield? What is gross rental yield? Rental yield is defined as when monthly rent times 12 months divided by property price give you a percentage, and that's rental yield. So there are some of you here are investors because you are already with TYT and you're investing with some properties already. Do you know what kind of rental yield that you're getting in the area that you invest? Anyone has any idea? Or do you know the rental yield in Toronto or in Vancouver? Anyone has any idea? Not really. Well, according to from according to this website, Vancouver and Toronto's rental yield is about four percent. It's about four percent. So when the realtor knows that you are an investor and you're trying to buy a property, and they will try to sell you and and say something like, "Oh, this is a good investment property, which will give you five percent rental yield." Why do you think? Why do you think that they say that? Does 5% mean that it is a good deal? No, we don't know yet. They want you to believe that it is a good deal. Not only because it's 5%, like a 1% higher than the normal yield that you could find anywhere. It's because this rental yield number is always a positive number. Positive number makes you feel good. It makes you feel that you are making money and making a good decision. But are you? Well, let's take a look at this equation again. Rental yield is when there is rent coming in every month, well, this will be a positive number. But this equation never accounts any expenses. It just tells you the income. It never accounts any expenses, which means whenever there is rent, it will be a positive number. So we don't even know whether you're making money. To me, the rental yield doesn't really matter. What's more important is as an investor, we have to ask ourselves, what is my return on investment? What is my ROI? That's more important. Now, ROI is defined as when net profit divided by the cost times 100% give you an ROI. This is very important here because it's net profit. Income minus expenses. It already accounts the expenses. So that's a very important equation uh, to remember. Here's another one called cash on cash return. It's similar to ROI. However, this is an annual calculation. So we use a cash flow, which is the net profit times 12 months is an annual calculation divided by investment capital will give you a cash on cash return. Now here we say investment capital, not necessarily the purchase price of the property. What is the difference? What is the difference between investment capital and property price? Can anyone tell me that? Is that your uh, down payment and closing costs? 
Thank you, Kim. That's absolutely correct. Investment capital is your down payment and closing costs. Let's don't worry about the closing costs for now, but majority of that amount is the down payment. So assuming that you're buying, let's say you're buying a $1 million property, chances are you're not going to bring in $1 million cash to buy that property, right? You will try to go to a bank to borrow a loan if you are qualified for it. And as an investment property, you need to come up with at least 20% down payment. So that 20% of a $1 million property, that's $200,000. So as an investor, I want to know when I come up with $200,000, not $1 million, $200,000 as my investment capital, how much of a profit do I make back every single year? And that's what this cash on cash return means. Now, now that you have some understanding of how ROI work, cash on cash return, rental yield. Let's analyze a deal together. This is a current listing, an apartment selling in downtown Toronto. Two bedroom, two bath, 822 square foot apartment in Toronto. Hide 58th floor with very nice lake view, Got a, got a balcony, park, two parking spots, two lockers. It's got indoor pool, gym, party room, resource style, amenities, all the good stuff. And very close access to highways, ministry downtown, and airport. So for those who live in Ontario, in Toronto, GTA area, take a guess how much is one of these apartments would cost nowadays? 2600 2700 how much, Oscar? 26 to 2700 I'm not talking about the rent. I'm talking about how much to buy that property. Oh, uh, 700 to 900K. Seven, uh, where do you live, Oscar? Toronto. Toronto, okay. Well, we're talking about like downtown Toronto with a great view. That's a little bit low. I see that John is saying uh, on the chat saying 1.2 mil. Miranda and Benny saying 1.6. John is right. John, well, John is in Vancouver, right? So Toronto and Vancouver's pri Vancouver pricing are pretty much fairly close to each other. We see this a lot in Vancouver as well. So something like this, 1.2 million, maybe from 1 million and up depends on the location and how high this floor is, so 1.2 million. So let's assume that you're gonna buy this particular property and you put 20% down, which is 239. And you're gonna to go to the bank and borrow a loan, 959, assuming that you are qualified for that particular loan. All right, so I bought this property and I'm gonna rent it out. The rent actually was pretty decent. 4100 per month. Ah, that's not bad, right? $4,100, that's, that's quite a lot of money. So let's take a look at the cash flow analysis. Of course, the expenses, the first thing we look at the mortgage payment. Right now, interest rate anywhere between 6 to 7%. So let's use 6.2%, for example. So that mortgage payment itself is over $5,800 a month for the mortgage payment and tax and insurance, the PD payment. That's not it because this is in a condo, an apartment. There is management, maintenance fee, strata fee, and property management. So all in all, your cash flow is negative $3,400 a month. I mean, you work hard, you work so hard for your job, earn a paycheck. Now you save up all this money and buy an investment property like this in Vancouver or Toronto. And you were hoping that you could invest and make some money. And yet you're losing $3,400 a month. Look at the rental yield. The rental yield is a positive 4.1%. Once again, positive number. It makes you feel good, right? You feel that you're making money. But are you really making money? Huh? Not so much. Cash on cash return is negative 
percent, negative 17 percent. So it really doesn't matter whether you go to like Toronto, Vancouver, or even like New York, San Francisco, LA, Sydney, Hong Kong, and London, Singapore, they give you the same result, negative cash flow. And sometimes you will find buying real estate, real estate, it's like choosing a spouse. Why? Because if you don't choose wisely, both can be expensive to maintain and you can be stuck for a long time. So be really, really careful. <laughs> now, some of you will say, Stephen, we already know that. Like, we are not buying like apartment like this in high price city like Toronto and Vancouver. We want to buy in maybe a couple hours away from the city, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna buy individual house, not apartment. So that and sometimes these individual house could have multiple source of, of rental income because maybe you have a basement suite that you could rent it out to second tenant. So then we can actually get some possibility higher cash flow, right? Well, let's take a look at this. This is a triplex in London, Ontario. London, Ontario is about two hours drive away from Toronto. And this particular triplex, so three individual units, three one bedroom units, all self-contained with their own entrance and bathroom and kitchen. And this particular triplex is only $700,000, which is half a million dollars cheaper than the apartments in Toronto. Only $700,000. And it got like three rental unit. So three streams of income. We should be able to make it work, right? So let's take a look. So same thing. You have to come up with at least 20% down, which is $140,000. 80% mortgage, which is $560,000 that you borrow from the bank, assuming you qualify for the loan. Now we collect the rent from three different tenants. Altogether is 2,800 minus mortgage, tax, insurance, the PD payment, maintenance and repair. This is a house. There is definitely some maintenance and repair cost. Property management. Boom, your cash flow is still in negative, $2,114. Look at the rental yield, close to 5%, definitely higher than what you can get in Toronto. But are you making money? Hmm, not so much, negative 18%. Are some of you feeling like this little hamster right now? Like low, no matter how hard you tried, you still run around in circle and not moving forward in your life and financial situation. So who right now is feeling like this little hamster that you are still in the rat race? Anyone? Okay. That's all right. That's why you come here to learn about real estate and how we invest to achieve financial freedom, right? But what is financial freedom? We have to define this first. We have to define it first. Clement asks, what is the purpose of rental yield? Okay, it is just a uh, quick indication and a lot of in investors are using. To me, I don't put too much focus on it, okay? But you have to know that that exists. And some people actually just give you those information about rental yield. To me, it doesn't give me too much value, okay? Just a quick estimate, really. So what is financial freedom anyways? Because... You come to a real estate investing seminar and who would like, who would like to achieve financial freedom by a show of hands? Pretty much everyone, thank you. Now for those who just, just come into this seminar, feel free to turn on your camera and participate so that I could see you, see, see that you're learning and you're taking notes, all right? So what is financial freedom? Well, financial freedom is, when passive income, when your passive income equals or greater than your monthly expenses, you are financially free. Why? What does that mean? Well, let's take a look. First of all, what is passive income? Earlier, I have already explained that to you. 
passive income is something like when you buy an investment properties, structure it correctly, and then you have positive cash flow every single month, and that's passive income. And when all those passive income coming in, it's enough to pay off all your personal expenses, like your rent and mortgage for your house that you live in, your transportation, your groceries bill, your utilities, your education, insurance, medical bills, et cetera, et cetera. If all this passive income is enough to pay off all your monthly expenses, in that case, do you still have to go to work? Ted is like shaking the head. Well, put it this way. You have options. You have options. Maybe some of you still like your job and you could decide to go to work. That's fine. That's fine. But one day, if you feel that you are tired, that you want to fire your boss, guess what? You could because... My passive income is enough to pay off all my bills, so I don't have to worry about going to work anymore. And that's financial freedom. Now, this personal expenses, everyone in this room has a different number. Some of you, let's say if you're young and you live with your parents, chances are your monthly expenses could be very, very low. Maybe you can get by with a thousand to two thousand dollars a month. Some of you, maybe you are a parent and you have three kids living with you and a couple more pets. Well, then your monthly expenses would be fairly high. I don't know, maybe $5,000, $7,000, or even $10,000 and up. So only you know that number. According to this website, an average Canadian who lives in Toronto needs about $4,500 per month. That's just the cost of living in Toronto, very similar to Vancouver. And of course, Toronto and Vancouver being one of the higher cost of living cities in Canada. So we'll use this as a number. Now, for those who live in a different city, you may have a different number. But all in all, what it, it's more important is how much you're spending every single month. But right now, I'm just going to use this as an average number since this tells me that that's the average cost of living in Toronto. So let's say if my personal expenses is $4,500 a month, okay, my expenses. If your personal expenses is $3,000, you put in $3,000. If your personal expense is $7,000, you put in $7,000 in this equation, all right? So if my personal expenses is $4,500 a month and I am going to go buy one small property, a small investment properties, and this small house will give me a positive cash flow of $1,000. One property, $1,000 passive income. Now, this cash flow is pure profit already. It already minus all those expenses, the PD payment and everything. And it gives me a positive of $1,000. How many small houses like this do I need to buy before I can become financially free? Thank you, John. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Aaron. I see that your hand's putting that up. Yes, you, min you need minimum five of these houses. So you get the math. However, some of you were like, hmm, Stephen, you have to buy how many? Five properties? That's a lot of properties. And it sounds like that's a lot of money that I will need. And it's going to take forever. Oh my God, like how can I achieve this? Okay, I get it. What about that I tell you now that you could buy one big property, one big house, and this big house could generate a $4,500 positive cash flow per month. Now, how many big houses like this do I need to buy before I can achieve financial freedom now? Just one, right? You don't need to buy five. You don't need to buy 10. Just buy one property and you're financially free. But some of you may say, Stephen, like I get the math, but where in the world can I buy this one big property that gives me $4,500 per month passive income? And yet, 
it has to be affordable for me to buy. So who would like to know where and how to buy these big houses to give you $4,500 cash flow? All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, hold your horses and I will share with you today where and how we buy these houses. When we invest, there are three steps and six rules. Three steps and six rules. So for those who don't know, make sure you write this down. Three step process of real estate investing. The first step is S. S stands for strategy. Strategy. Meaning that you have to know what type of strategy that you're going to apply before you even look at houses. You don't go just go and look for houses randomly. You have to determine what strategy that you want to do first. Is it lease option? Is it income properties? Is it a distress? What exactly that you want to do, do first? Then with the strategy in mind, then we look for M, which is the market. The market. Which market that fits that particular strategy that you want to do? And within that market, then we look for P, as in the property. So SMP is the correct order for us as an educated investors to do. What do I mean by that? Let's say that our strategy today is we look at multi-unit residential, right? So I'll look for which market has the best demand for that particular strategy. I'll look into which province that is suitable and have a huge demand for multi-unit residential properties. Maybe New Brunswick or, or is it Mountain, St. John in New Brunswick. Then I will pick the city that's got the best looking numbers and demand. Then in that particular area, I will look for the properties that give me the best result, best performance result. Then I will consider to buy that property. So SMP is the correct order. However, most uneducated investors do the opposite. They PM asset. They PM asset. Now, for those who know what PMS stands for, it gives you a lot of trouble and headache, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's why these people are buying properties like this. They literally buy and pray. That's their strategy. They buy and pray. But as educated investors, we do SMP. We talk about the three steps. Here's the six rules. Six rules of real estate investing. Rule number one is we make offers and be embarrassed. Make offers and be embarrassed. Why? Well, first of all, how many houses are you going to buy and how much money are you going to make if you are not making any offers? How many houses are you going to buy and how much money are you going to make if you don't make any offers? Exactly. Zero. That's it. Nothing. As Wayne Gretzky says that, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So take the shots. So the first rule is we make offers. And the offer has to be a, no num a lo low number that you feel embarrassed. Why? Because nowadays there are some areas that you need to put in an offer that is higher than the listed price. No, we don't want to get into like a bidding war. We want good deals. Because imagine that if you make your first offer and the seller accepts that, what does it really tell you? You pay too much. You left money on the table. You could have paid less. That's why you have to make an offer that you even feel embarrassed by it. Because we want you to make money when you buy. 
We want you to make money when you buy. I don't want you to just make money when you sell the property. I want you to make money right away. That's very important. And have multiple exits. Have multiple exits. What, the, what do I mean by that? It means that the SMP, the strategy, is one thing that we have to be focused on. However, as an investor, I don't just know one strategy. I have to need to know multiple strategies just in case this strategy that I want to do doesn't work. For example, maybe some of you want to buy a house, fix it up and flip it for a quick pot of cash, buy, fix and flip. Nothing wrong with that, that's a strategy. However, what if after you fix the property, the market turns, the, pro the prices has been coming down and you cannot sell the property? What are you gonna do? Well, with multiple strategies in mind, then you could maybe quickly turn it to possible a short-term rental like Airbnb, or maybe turn it into a rent to own or lease option deal. As an investors, we know multiple strategies. So before you even get into a strategy, make sure that you learn other strategies first. Add value. What do I mean by that? Add value is when I buy, buy property, not just buy as is. Usually I will renovate it. When I renovate it, it adds value. I instantly push the property's value to go up. I force it to appreciate. I don't wait for the property to appreciate to appreciate slowly over time. That's taking too long. I force it to appreciate right away. So I will add value to it. Maintain integrity, that's very important because when we are in real, real estate business, oftentimes it involves a lot of money. When it comes to money, sometimes it really tests human beings' integrity. My advice is if you want to be in this business for a long run, trust is the key. So stay ethical, honest, and maintain integrity. Last but not least is we must have an ROI mindset. What is an ROI mindset? Well, ROI mindset is we do not focus on the cost. What we look at is we focus on the return. If the return is good, then the cost is okay. So don't count the cost of a shovel when digging for gold. That's the ROI mindset. Now, of course, today we talk about this particular topic, income properties or multi-unit residential. When we talk about income property, we could be referring to a single family house like this. However, in here, we focus more on multi-unit residential, like an apartment building. The fact is, once you started to invest in multi-unit residential building, you may never want to go back to invest in the single family house. So when we are dealing with multi-unit residential building, we have a lot of possible revenues, like income stream, and there are some expenses as well. So let's brainstorm this together. Let me actually switch to my iPad. Okay, so I will need your participation here right now. So let's talk about some revenue. Okay, when we own a multi-unit residential building, now, of course, one major type of revenue would be rent, right? When, even when you rent out a single family house, the income is rent. And when there is a, let's say a basement suite that you rent out, that's a second stream of rent, but it is still a rent revenue. When we own a multi-unit residential building, there are other revenue stream as well. So can anyone here tell me what other 
revenues that you can think of that a building could bring in for you? Anyone? Parking. Thank you. I think I think both Kim and Oscar say the same thing. Parking. Yes, you could definitely charge for parking. Laundry. Laundry. Yes. Thank you. Vending machines. Vending machines. I like that. Storage. Advertising. I heard people say, some someone said storage. Right. And advertising. What exactly is that? Now. Usually when you own a property like this, sometimes it could be on a busy street and the wall outside could be some, there are some vacant space that you could take advantage of. So what you could do is contact advertising agency, set up billboards, right? Get some advertising money in. Good. What else then can you think of? Office space. Office space. Okay. I like I like that idea. Anything else? Cell towers. Ah, thank you. Thank you, John. Cell towers. Because on the rooftop, absolutely wasted space, right? You could negotiate with cell, cell phone companies, carriers like Rogers, Bell. Maybe have a cell towers put on top of the building. Very good revenue there. Sometimes that revenue alone is more than the rents that you collected from the tenants. That's a good one. What else? Solar panels. Solar panels, okay. Now, I can think of something that is very, very related to parking is what about EV charging? Nowadays, there are so many EVs out there, set up EV charging station, that's possible. Um, maybe all, in, instead of office space, maybe it could be set up a gym, you could charge for, for that as well. That's totally possible, right? And depending on you know, your location, you may also charge pet fees. These are all possible revenue that could be added to your overall pool. Awesome. So now let's talk about expenses. What kind of expenses do we have to pay? Snow removal. Sure. One at a time. Snow removal. Ah, okay. Mortgage. Snow removal. Mortgage, okay. Hang on to that mortgage just yet, okay? okay. I will get back to this in a moment. So be besides mortgage, what else? Insurance. Insurance? Property management. Property management, yes. Repair and maintenance. Repair and maintenance. CapEx. What was that again? CapEx. Capital expenditures. Capital like, expenditure. Like uh, furnace or... Um, oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Okay. Like utilities. Okay, for the common area. What else? Pest control. Aha. Uh -huh. What else? Oh, I see Miranda says garbage. Okay. What about vacancy? Vacancy for sure. What else? Security. Security, that's a good one. Maybe you want to in install security alarm system, or sometimes you need to change change locks and stuff. Yeah. Water and sewer. Okay. Anything else?
What about? I think Miranda and Benny wrote also uh, like landscaping. Yes, like maybe lawn, right? Lawn. And we want to think outside the box. Here's another one. How about legal fees? Accounting fees. And we want to add those as well. Right? Taxes. Yeah. How can we forget that? Perfect. I think that covers pretty much uh, most of the expenses. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Let me switch back to my PowerPoints. PowerPoint. So that's my list right there. I think we pretty much cover, yeah, most of them. Good, thank you. Thank you for your help. So now that we have all this revenue and expenses, we need to analyze whether the deal makes sense for us. So there are definitely some KPIs that we could look at, key performance indicators. And KBI usually helps measure like a, a company's success and illustrate the progress towards its goal. So when dealing with multi-unit residential properties, we use these KBIs to help us understand whether the property is performing. It gives us numerical data that quanti quantifies the performance. So that is very, very important. So make sure you write this down. First of all, what is net operating income? What is NOI? NOI is revenue minus expenses. Now we just talk about all those revenue and expenses. Revenue minus expenses give you the NOI. And of course, we want it to be greater than zero. Because if it is less than zero, it means that your expenses is higher than revenue, which is not a good thing. Now, when we discuss about expenses, and some of you were saying that, okay, what about the mortgage? And we did, did not put the mortgage in the expenses column just yet. We actually put it in here. So when the NOI minus the debt surfacing, basically the mortgage payment that will give you your cash flow. Now, why we here, we put debt servicing, not just mortgage payment, because when we are dealing with a large building like this, sometime, sometimes we don't borrow money just from the bank. We could be borrowing money from private lenders, joint venture partners, maybe venture take backs or seller financing. So they are all under a lump sum of debt surfacing. So NOI minus all this debt surfacing gives you the cash flow. And once again, we want this cash flow to be greater than zero. Obviously, we want it to make money every single month. Here's another one. What is cash flow per unit? Cash flow per, per unit is pretty straightforward. We take the monthly cash flow divided by the number of units in your building. We got a month money dollar amount. Now, typically, for example, in this case, I wanted to make a minimum $75 per unit per month. Now I say for example, because this is just for your reference only. These requirements tend to change depending on the location, the type of building, and your goal. I just give you an example for you to consider. So when you eventually work with your mentor, your mentor will understand what you want to achieve and determine the KPI numbers that are suitable for you. But just to give you an example, $75 per unit per month. And cap rate, 
what is cap rate, the capitalization rate. It's the ratio between the net operating income produced by the asset and its capital cost. So it is a market performance indicator. Different areas has different cap rates. Typically, the more expensive the properties are, the lower the cap rate. So if you're investing in Vancouver and Toronto, well, it will be a very low cap rate, typically less than 4%. Whereas if you invest in Alberta or New Brunswick, and you may have a higher cap rate, could be 6%, okay? So when I invest, I want to have a higher cap rate as possible. For example, higher than 6%. According to this website, these are some average cap rates that you could get from different cities in Canada. So as you can see, Vancouver and Toronto would be typically around 3%. But when you go to Winnipeg, and uh, then you have up to like 6%. Cash on cash return, we talked about that earlier, is any annual cash flow divided by investment capital give you the cash on cash return. Now, everyone has a different, different goal. For me, when I invest, I want to make sure that my cash on cash return is double digit, higher than 10%. Not just me. I mean, you have your own goal. Once again, work with your strategy coach, work with your mentor to determine what makes sense to you, all right? And this goal would, could change over time. What is cost per unit? Cost per unit. This is quite straightforward. Cost per unit means the purchase price divided by the number of units in that building. That's your cost per unit. Once again, for example, I want to make sure that my cost per unit is less than 100K. Once again, it depends on where you are investing and your goal. Right? This is just my personal preference that I want to make sure that I buy per unit is less than 100K. What is coverage ratio? Well, coverage ratio measures a property's net income versus its debt obligations. So it can help you understand whether the property has enough net operating income to pay back the loans. So to calculate coverage ratio, divide net NOI by debt surfacing. For example, if the coverage ratio is higher than 1.2, that means that the property makes at least 20% more income than it needs to cover its debts. So for example, I wanted more than 1.2. Last but not least, what is GRM? Gross Rental Multiplier. What is Gross Rental Multiplier, GRM? Purchase price divided by rental income give you a GRM. The GRM shows the potential, potential profitability of a property. The lower the GRM, the healthier the investment is. So typically, we want it smaller than eight. Now, notice that these KPIs, they tend to change from time to time. Okay? So work with your mentor and get the most accurate current value for your goal. Now that we have all these indicators, let's talk about some deals that we could analyze together. This is actually one of my multi-unit property in St. John, New Brunswick that I bought in 2015. Now this is a small one, only a triplex, a th three unit triplex in St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, two three-bedroom and one one-bedroom unit I bought in 2015. Take a wild guess. How much is one of these property costs when I bought it, bought it in 
2015. Any guess? I'm sorry? 400? 400. Any other? Who says 400, by the way? John. Oscar. Oscar. Oh, Oscar. Oscar. Okay, John, what do you think? That was actually going to be my guess, too, exactly. 400. Okay. Anyone wants, more, wants to pay more than 400? 160. Joe, you see, this is like an auction. Some, somebody already said 400. You're not supposed to go down to 160. That's not how it works. I asked, who wants to pay more than 400? <laughs> Susanna is, nah. <laughs> 400. From Oscar and John. Anyone wants to pay more than 400? 400 going once. Do I hear 410? Do I hear 410? 410 anywhere? Anyone? 410? Come on, come on. This got to be worth more than 410? 410. 410, who's, who's that? Atuf. Atuf, Atuf. Atuf is offering 410. Thank you, congratulations. 410 going once. Anyone wants to pay more than 410? Do I hear 420? Do I hear 4, 420? Anyone? 410 twice. Anyone wants to pay more than 410? No? So to Atuf, 410. Congratulations, everyone. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. You just bought a property. How much did I pay for it? Did I see someone just fall off from the chair? Wait a minute. What did I say, tell you, real estate investing rule number one and number two is? Make offers, be embarrassed, make money when you buy. When they ask for 70,000, did I pay 70,000? What do you think? Yeah, I bought it at 60, $60,000. Now, I'm, so, I'm sorry that some of you make mistake that you paid too much. I'm not trying to embarrass you here. You know what? It's okay to make mistake in this room because this is a safe environment. You don't know what you don't know. That's why it's so important that you learn it first before you go out and try to invest. Otherwise, when you make mistakes out there in the real market, you're gonna lose a lot of money, right? So learn it first, learn it first. Some, oh, John asked, can I ask if you offer lower initially and then work your way up? Absolutely, absolutely. And I'll, sh I'll share with you how I came up with that number in the moment. So like, by now, you know that I live in Vancouver, right? I live in Vancouver. I mean, what can I buy in Vancouver with $60,000? Not even a toilet. And there I bought the whole building. So there's some closing costs, $3,000 and renovation. Now, here's the thing. When I see this property, it was vacant. So it's a little bit distressed as well. So I sent in my power team of people, my realtor and my contractor to go in to look at the property and it comes back and tell me that, okay, Stephen, if you want to make this work, you need to fix this first and it will cost you around $26,000 to fix everything before you could rent it out. So now I have a number to work with and I will back work calculate what kind of return I want, then I will make my offer in. John, that's how it works. It's not how much that they're asking is important, it's how much I want to make. And then I work my number backwardly to find out what I want to offer. I could start with 50,000 and then you know, negotiate and then we come into the middle, $60,000. So I look at it, okay, 26,000, I put in the, the cost for renovation. So my total investment was 89,500. 
What's interesting is the after repair value. Remember, I told you to add value, add value to the property, right? I renovated the property. I forced it to appreciate right away. So I did another appraisal after the renovation. It's worth 137000 now for the property. Let's take a look at the cash flow. The revenue that I'm getting is $30,000 a year. Minus the expenses. My NOI is 12840 Cash flow is $1,070 a month. Cash on cash return is 14.3%. So remember I said earlier that if my expenses is $4,500, I'm gonna go out and buy one small property. That gives me $1,000 cash flow. Well, there you go. This is the small property that I'm referring. One small property give me over $1,000 passive income every single month. So let's compare this side by side to the apartments in Toronto or in Vancouver that you saw earlier. That's worth $1.2 million. You bought that and it gives you a negative cash flow of $3,400. Cash on cash return is negative 17%. Or maybe you could like me that I go and buy property like multi-unit property here in New Brunswick. The purchase price and repair together is 89000 The difference is it generates positive cash flow of over $1,000 per month. Cash on cash return is 14.3%. So now, do you see the difference? Which one would you like to buy? Do you want to buy the one on the left or the one on the right? <laughs> Mike says, tough call. What do you guys think? Left or right? Right. Right. Thank you, Kim. Go to the right side, of course. Now, assuming that you have 1.2 million, that you could buy one apartment building in Toronto, and you're paying $3,400 every single month. You know, with $1.2 million, how many properties like that on the right-hand side can you buy with $1.2 million? You can literally buy 13 of them. 13! And with every single one gives you $1,000 passive income. 13 altogether, you get $13,910 passive income income every single month. So let that sink in for the moment. Instead of buying one apartment in Toronto, in Vancouver, and with all those money, you could go ahead and buy 13 of those, these multi-unit in New Brunswick and earn close to $14,000 passive income per month. When you have $14,000 passive income per month coming to you without you have to go to work, Are you financially free? That's how it works. Now, as an investor, we have to differentiate what's the difference between assets and liability. What is an asset? Well, asset is things that put money into our pocket every single month. Basically, liability is the other way around, as something that take money out of your pocket every single month. So it's a very simple concept, asset and liability. So I want to make sure that everyone in this room knows how assets and liability works. So on my screen here, you will see two columns, assets and liability. In a moment, I'm going to display an item on the screen. So I want you guys to unmute yourself. And if you think that item is an asset, you shout asset. If you think that item is a liability, you shout liability, all right? So let's do this exercise together. Everyone unmute yourself and get ready. Go ahead, unmute yourself. So first item on the screen, assets or liability, a rental investment. Asset. 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 
There are there are some confusion there. It is a trick question. <laughs> Rental investment is an asset only if it generates positive cash flow. It if it gives you negative cash flow, then it becomes a liability. Some people are buying liability thinking that it is an asset. So be really careful. Next item on the screen, asset or liability? A new luxury car. Liability. Ah, now this is very clear that everyone knows that a brand new luxury car is a liability. And yet some of you still want to buy a luxury car right now, right? Unless it cash flows on okay. That's okay. Oh, unless it's Turo. Oh, I see what, what you, you're going at, Joe. And maybe you got a Lamborghini or something, you know? <laughs> You're going up. <laughs> now, you know what? We are human beings. We all have wants. So I think it's okay to buy some wants. However, before you buy into all these liabilities, first invest into assets. The asset will generate money, then you can have all the money to buy whatever you want in life. That's okay. You, there are just a certain step to it. Now, the next item, everyone in this room should know the answer. So everyone, unmute yourself. I want you to say the answer out loud. Asset or liability? Your spouse. Liability. Asset. It depends. Asset. It depends. It depends. <laughs> Well, I agree with you. <laughs> a lady saying that the spouse is a liability. Oh my God. <laughs> and the guy is like, oh, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> well, if, if you're lucky that your spouse is in the asset column, well, congratulations. Well, what about yourself? Have you, have you thought about that part, huh? <laughs> And if some of you are a little bit unlucky that your spouse turns into a liability column, don't worry, just like any investments, we always have an exit strategy to protect you. You know that, right? <laughs> well, some of you are taking notes now, like, you know, yeah. learning. <laughs> That's the most important thing that you learn for the whole day. <laughs> Let's move on. What about ignorance? That's a lot of Liability. 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 Definitely liability. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it, especially when we're talking about investing. Because if you make one mistake, it could be costly. What about this one? Education. Uh, asset. asset. Education is an asset because if you learn it, it goes into your brain. Nobody can take it away from you. You could use the same knowledge to earn money again and again and again. So education is definitely an asset. If Here's you apply it. What was that? I said, if you apply it. If you apply it. That's true, though. That's true, though. Thank you, John. So here's another deal that I want to share with you. Here is a deal done by a TYT student. And he bought this at 800000 12-unit building. Put in 30% down, $240,000. In fact, it's not even his own money. He doesn't have that 240000 He was able to raise that and joint venture with a money partner. All right? So when you come to learn creative financing in our advanced training, you will learn more about how we could structure a, a deal like this without using your own money. So a joint venture partner is bringing 240000 and they bought this deal. The revenue together is 175000 for the whole 12 unit. The expenses is 87000 Of course, we need to pay for the mortgage. That gives him the cash flow of $55,000 a year. That's over 4600 a month passive income. Cash on cash return is 23%. So as I said earlier, if my expenses is $4,500 a month and I'm going to go out and buy one big property that gives me cash flow of $4,500, well, this is the big property that I'm talking about. That gives me 4,600 positive cash flow. And Joe was asking, what year was that? I believe that was 2018, right? So that's not it. 
because after this TYT student bought this particular property, and he went back to his mentor, original mentor who mentored him, because he wants to know if there's anything else that he could do to make it perform better. Because he bought the property as is, like there's already renters inside and it's already getting revenue. And the mentor look at it and, and say, say, huh, this property is actually underperforming. So what, what that was is the previous landlord did not take any steps to raise rent in some time. Market rents at least is $150 more than what, like per unit more than what was collected. So he was able to increase the rent from each tenant after the lease ex expired or tenants moved out when there's new lease coming in and he was able to increase the rent over time. So that extra $150 per unit per month, 12 units together, that's the $21,000 revenue increase. Yeah, that's and there is also a laundry in this particular building. There's a washer and dryer, coin operated. So people would, uh, it's $1 per, per washed, $1 per dry. So normally people have to take their clothes like down the street at laundromat to do the laundry, same cost. But they look at it, well, we have all these laundry machines in the same building. Why don't we charge extra 25 cents per cycle? That's a convenience fee. Tenants glad to pay for that extra 25 cents so that they don't have to, to travel to do their laundry. And they found some wasted space inside the building. They built an eight storage lockers, knowing that this is a 12 unit building, We've got only eight lockers. They get rented out right away. They found some un, like unused space at, at the behind the building. They pay for it in life nicely at three additional parking spots. That's 2,880. So all in all, with the help of the mentor, this TYT student was able to increase the revenue by another $30,000 a year, just with the help of the mentor. That's amazing. Not just one time, it's every year, another $30,000. So this is the previous calculations. But with the help of a mentor, he was able to increase $30,000. That's 54% increase in revenue. I mean, when was the last time you have a 54% increase in your salary from your job? Does that even happen? I have a question. Oh, really? <laughs> I have a question. Um, yes. So where did uh, that money come, where did the capital come from uh, that he used to improve the property? Because it doesn't seem like it's taken into consideration on the right-hand side. Okay. So there's very small amount. Now, first of all, in terms of the rent increase, you don't have to really improve it because it's already, it was like, it was rented like at a lower rate. So now they over time, they increase the rate. There's no not much money that you have to put in. So, and same as the coin laundry, the only small investments that you need to increase will be the lockers that you have to build and also the, the pavement for the parking spots. I believe that's very, very minimal compared to how much you can make in okay. this calculations. So I just want to simplify this calculation for you. So I did not add that extra cost. But when you think about it, those are very minimal expenses. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. a good question. Thank you. So let's go into a live deal analysis. Live deal analysis together. Now I told you that there are some key performance indicators, some KPIs. So let's have a test right now, okay? See who has paid attention. First of all, what is NOI? How do you calculate NOI? Revenue minus expenses. Thank you, Oscar. 
I think it's Oscar who answered it. Yes, NOI is revenue minus expenses, and we want it to be greater than zero. All right? What is cash flow? How do we calculate cash flow from here? NOI minus uh, debt repayment. Yes, thank you. NOI minus debt servicing. Once again, we want it to be greater than zero. What is cash flow per unit? Cash flow divided by the number of units in the property? Correct. Monthly cash flow divided by the number of units in that building. For example, $75 per month per unit. What is cap rate? Net operating income divided by purchase price or value times 100. Thank you, George. Which one should we use? Divided by purchase so price or the question. value? I have yes. a question. Which one, which one should you use, the purchase price or the value? When you are buying it, use the purchase price. Okay. Later on, when you divide, later on, like after you own this property later on, maybe the value has gone up, then you use the value, not your original purchase price. Okay, thank you. Okay. What, what is cash on cash return? Cash flow divided by um, closing costs plus debt servicing. Annual cash flow divided by your capital, your investment capital. And most likely we want it to be, like for me, I want it to be high, higher than 10%, double digit return. What is cost per unit? This one should be easy. Yeah, the purchase price divided by the number of units. Thank you, Kim. Purchase price divided by the number of units. So for me, I want it to be less than 100K per unit. What is coverage ratio? At operating income divided by debt servicing. Thank you. NOI divided by debt servicing, and we want it to be greater than 1.2. What is GRM? Purchase price divided by gross rental income. Thank you. Purchase price divided by rent or revenue, and we want it to be smaller than eight. And what is rental yield? Annual rent divided by property price times 100. Thank we you. Don't, we don't want Toronto at 4%. <laughs> <laughs> rent to you, rent divided by purchase price. Like for me, I look for anything over the 10%. Now, for those who didn't write this down, feel free to go ahead and take a picture or a screenshot of this, a summary of it. If you find this useful, go ahead. I don't mind. Stephen, is the 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 rental yield is different from the gross rental yield, or is it the same? Thing? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Okay, and so I guess, like again, going back to, I think it was Clement's original question, like what's even the value of that if it's always a positive number? Yeah, um, it's just a quick math. Some investors use it. I personally don't look at it that much. Put it this way, but as an investor, you just have to know what it is about and how to calculate it, okay? Helps but you so you don't get duped by a real estate agent. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> they tell you that, oh, this is like 5% uh, return, like a uh, rental yield. And you thought that, oh, that sounds like a good deal. Some people mm -hmm. might confuse it with a cap rate, right? So you get confused. You don't know what, what they're talking about. You think they're the expert and you're like, okay. Yeah. And bingo, Sometimes bingo, you're in a negative cash flow deal. Exactly. Sometimes they just throw you at some like a technical term to value, right? But as an investor, you have to know what they mean. Okay, let's do a live deal together. This is a live deal. I actually just go on to realtor.ca and look for a multi-unit. You can actually find it right now. It's uh, in St. John, New Brunswick. This is a 15 unit, 15 unit. You can actually look it up if you like, it's out there. So here's a description. It's a profitable 15 unit 
multi-family building located in the heart of St. John, containing 12 rooms and three single bedroom apartments close to all uptown amenities and attractions. Building has been well maintained and never has vacancy. Wow. New net natural gas furnace 2021 and new roof seven years ago. Annual revenue is about 91,440. Expenses are as follows. Tax, 7,976. 7, Garbage, 1,980. Water and sewage, 6,153. Electricity, 7,963. Maintenance, 1,014. Insurance, 3,591. Heat, 9,977. Total expenses, or added all those together, 38,654. All right. So these are the data provided by the listing, the realtor. All right. So let's do an analysis together. See whether it makes sense to buy this. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I've, uh, this is in the listing. Uh, say that these values are not in the listing. Some of them can be easily found, such as taxes um that you could get a fire insurance quote but some of them such as garbage removal water and sewage electricity maintenance heat how do you estimate those values put it this way you could request for it when we buy a multi-unit building like this you could talk to the listing agents and request a seller to provide you information all right mm -hmm. I happen to find this particular deal that it lists quite a few expenses already. So it's a lot easier for me to show this to you. But okay. when you're actually doing comparison, looking for deals, and it is your job to really to dig into it, to ask. All right. Because okay. if you don't ask, you don't get it. Okay. All right. Okay. So with all those numbers, let's do some calculations. Revenue. We already know that. They told you it's 91,440. Expenses, they also told you is 38,654. So what is uh, the NOI? Now is the time that you pull out your calculator and do some work. Nobody get this? This is a simple one. Okay, John says 52786. You are right. So is this looking okay? Because we want NOI to be greater than zero, right? So revenue is more than expenses. Yeah, it looks okay to me. All right. Next one. The purchase price is 649800 Okay. And now I I will negotiate, but right now. Let's just assume that you buy at the purchase price for now, okay? So let's say the interest is 7%, five years variable, 30 years amortization, 70% loan to value mortgage that you get, okay? And I'll give, give this to you. The mortgage payment is 3,026 per month, which means per year is 36,312. So you can write this down. You don't need to calculate that. I'll just give it to you. Next one is cash flow. Because now we know the NOI, we know we know the debt surfacing. What is cash flow? Sixteen thousand four hundred and seventy-four. Thank you. Sixteen thousand seven four hundred seventy-four per year. That's the cash flow. Or 1372 per month. Does it look okay? Yeah, we want it to be positive. And it is de definitely a check mark. Looks good. Next one. We know the cash flow is 1372 per month. What is cash flow per unit? So you use 15 here? Mm hmm. Okay. So it's 91. Um... Wait, yeah, $91.52 per unit. Thank you, Kim. You got that right, $91.50. Next one. 
Everyone is following? So does it look good? Yeah, I say that I, I want it to be at least $75 per month per unit. So $91.50, yeah, let's give it a check mark. Next one, we know the NOI, we know the purchase price, what's the cap rate? Eight percent. Thank you. Eight point one percent. What was that? I said, oh, point one, yeah. Point one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to be technical. I think it counts, right? Yeah. No, yes, that's true. yes. But I mean, approximate is okay, right? We're just doing this as an example. Eight point one percent in this case, and I told you that for me, I want to be at least like double digit. Uh, uh, like it's not the double digit. This one cap rate, I want it to be bigger than larger than six. So 8.1% check mark. Next one. Cash flow, we know that is 16,474. And the capital is 194,000. So what is our cash on cash? Return. Eight point four percent. Eight point four five. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Eight point five percent. That's correct. So, is it good enough? Well. Depends. Some people think 8.5% is not bad. For me, I, I told you that I like double digit return. So this could be a question mark. Next one. We know the purchase price is 649. And what is the cost per unit? Forty three three twenty, which yeah. is under your amount that you want it to be at a hundred K per unit. Thank you very much, George. 43,320 per unit. And for me, I am hoping that is a bit below 100K per unit. So that's a check mark. Next one. We know the NOI, we know the debt surfacing. What's the coverage ratio? 8.5%. Thank you. 1.45. And I said that I want to be greater than 1.2, so another check mark. And we know the purchase price, we know the revenue. What is the GRM? The gross rental multiplier. Seven point one. Thank you, 7.1. The lower the number, the healthier the investment. And typically we want it to be smaller than eight. So another check mark. And we know the purchase price, we know the revenue. What's the rental yield? 14%. Thank you, 14%. And rental yield, typically I want it to be double digits as, as well. So that's the check mark. So basically, thank you for all your participation. And this is the final summary of what we just came up with. Now, by a show of hands, who like this deal and will buy it? But I may be confused. It sounds like a good deal. I don't know. But it's been on the market for over a, almost a year. So I don't that's know why. A, that's a actually very, very good observation, Kim. Thank you for that. Uh, if you look at the, the listing, it says, I think it was listed over 250 days. Something yeah, like that? 253, yeah. Yes, yes. So you wonder like why it is... If it is a good deal like this, why is it on the market for so long? Can it really be because the could it be because the cap rate's too close to current interest rates, especially if you need a commercial loan, maybe. 
you want you don't want to have like a your interest rate higher than your cap rate and you usually want a good margin between okay any anyone who who is not buying this and tell me why i, I think the best option here steven maybe buy rent and pray just just buy it and we'll hope for the best i think it looks good let's just hope for the best like it, it seems to me it checked most of the like check box right susan what do you think i've had um I've looked at these in St. John and the realtors tell me steer, steer very clear of them because the rooming houses tend to have a lot of problems because they've got um, very low income tenants in them and often drug issues and a, a whole host of other things. So um, they're just a real big headache. There, There is the possibility of of turning some of those rooms into units, two, three bedroom units, but it would be a really big headache and a lot of work. So it would depend on how much I think, how much you want to deal with. Okay. But if you look at the listing, it says there's no vacancy. So the demand is there. Of course, I don't know if if they, if if all these numbers that they provided are true. I just have to assume they are true right now, right? And thank you, uh, Susan, for for your input. Now, of course, you're listening to different like uh, inputs from different people, from realtors and their their experiences and stuff, right? Now, as a professional investor, all we need to do is to be logical. I am quite a logical and analytical analytical person that I love to analyze numbers and numbers don't lie. Now, by looking all at all these numbers, they do look good and very exciting. Yes, they look good. It checks all the box pretty much. But look at this particular page that we discuss, the revenue, now, I don't know if there are all the revenue accounted. In this case, I don't look at the revenue. I look at the expenses. So going back to that description, they told you all those expenses. Are we missing something here? Vacancy. Go ahead, Kim. Oh, sorry, vacancy rate. Vacancy. Yeah, what else? Probably I didn't see anything about lawn care snow removal. Okay. Lawn care, so it's no mofo. No? Anything else? Did I see? I don't think I saw property management. Correct. There was no property management. I was so surprised. 15 unit building and there was no property management. My God, I'm guessing that this landlord is managing it himself. So that's why that's property management fee is not there. Right? So let me ex exit the screen and I'll share with you one thing. Could it also be that the, because it's been on the market for so long that it's overvalued? It could be, I don't know. But what I would work with is the number that I've got. And okay. actually let me switch to a different screen. That might be a little bit easier. Let me switch to Stephen, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Um, when you said your uh, cash on cash return was 8.5, what was the number that you wanted ideally? Like for an example, it was it 12 percent, 10 percent? Everyone has different goal. Personally, I like Double digit, okay. So okay. basically, I use an Excel spreadsheet. Now, when you go to the advanced training for income properties, you will be given templates for you to quickly analyze a deal. So you will have a typical templates like this that you could put in. The asking price, 649, 
and the mortgage, how many unit, units, 15 units. And so revenue right now, we don't know all the extras. We'll just put in one lump sum of revenue, 91,440, and all the expenses that they told us, okay? And that's 38,000. And with all this information, my Excel spreadsheet already give me all this green color boxes and red box. Green is good, red is bad. Basically that is, right? So it gives, it fits into my criteria. What is cash flow per unit, per month? What's cap rate, cash on cash return? It calculates automatically. It automatically generates this for me. So, but as I said, when we look at the expenses here, it feels like there is a huge missing piece. So that's not the complete picture. For me as an investor, I want to make sure that I overestimate all the expenses first. So I would go put in like this. Now, this one, let me blow this up. So it's the same template. All these numbers are the same. Now, however, what I did add was this extra line here. that property management. Now, this is totally an estimate. 10% of the rent collected because the revenue is 91,000. So estimated 10%, that's 9,100. 9, I'll put in bookkeeping, legal, snow, lawn, pest control, vacancy, 5%. So with all this, it added together. Because in that picture, I didn't see they have too much like uh, grass or so I didn't put in the lawn. This one we don't need. So you see, that's the big difference. When I estimate it, I basically added an extra this, like uh, around 17,000 expenses to it that they didn't provide. So now my total expense is actually 56,000, not uh, 38,000 that they told me. My estimated expenses is 56. Now that dramatically changed my KPI. Look at that. NOI is now 35,000. And look at the cash flow from green to red. It was here. Thirteen hundred per month. Now it's negative. Cash flow per unit, negative. Cap rate, 5.4%. Now a lot of the green stuff turn to red. So now, do you want to buy this? Right? So you don't even have to go to really investigate what kind of tenants that they have, Suzanne. And just based on numbers, to me, it doesn't work. Now, to some other investors, uneducated investors, it may work. No, to me, it doesn't doesn't work. And besides, that's not it. Because we just talk about the investment capital, that being the 30%. Well, guess what? When you buy a property like this, there are a lot of costs and costs too. So here, my complete picture will be like this. Costs and costs, legal fee, 1%, land transfer tax, appraisal, inspection, lender's fee, mortgage broker fee, artist fee, that's total closing costs, another 31,000. So when you thought that you only need to invest 194, no, you need to add another 31,000 to it. That's my actual total investment capital. And once again, that changes my bottom line, my calculations here once again. Wow. Okay. So as I said, like, like who, who, like, who like this type of templates, Excel spreadsheet, who like, who like this? Yes. So when you go to take your advanced strategy course with Ryan about income properties, you'll be given spreadsheet like this. So there you go. Steven, oh, yes. could I ask, um, if you go like if you go back to the other uh, worksheet, actually, the original one that you showed us. <clears throat> so you've got one red box here. Um, yes. Let's just say theoretically, these numbers you felt were strongly accurate. Mm -hmm. um, I guess like... How much red do you accept? And I know that might be a hard question to answer. 
Um, but like, are there certain, um, are there certain equations or calculations that you're like, absolutely, it's, it's a no go if, you know, this calculation comes in red? Well, the answer is depends, yeah, right? Sure. And to me, to me, it has to be positive cash flow. That's the number yeah. one thing. Because if cash flow is, is red, forget about it. Forget about it. You don't even have to, 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 to go and do further investigation and analysis and due diligence. No. Like cash flow has to be positive. Right? Yes, as Nina said, cash flow is king or queen. I yes. have a question on that. Yeah. Like I, I know that's good. What if the vacancy rate is like 50% um, because the units are like run down or something? Like, is that like an exception for someone uh, where you know, okay, it's going to take me maybe two months to get this rented? That'll bring the cash flow up. Like, is that something that you just wouldn't even touch? Now, of course, you have to do uh, research on the same type of properties around the same neighborhood. What is the average vacancy are we talking about, right? We use right. market vacancy rate to kind mm -hmm. of estimate, you know, for this particular building, what kind of, what kind of vacancy is more uh, accurate. Here, I just use 5%. I mean, in, in the listing, they actually said that there's zero vacancy. Wow, I don't right. believe that. I would put five or maybe even 10. Right, just to be on the safe side. Like, as I said, I want to overestimate all these expenses. And at the end, if it still makes sense, then okay, then that could be a good deal. Right? Right. Okay. Thanks, Nina. I see that. That's good too. Okay. So let me switch back to my slideshow. And. So, of course, a lot of you have tons of questions right now, and I don't have all the time to answer all your questions. You may have more questions about income properties and multi-unit residential. So I do advise you to make an appointment, talk to one of the strategy coaches here at Trust Your Talent to discuss with them all the questions that you may have with income properties and how we could help you to move forward. So that's the web uh, link right there. If uh, Nina or Mike could put that link on to the chat so that the students here could make an appointment to talk to you guys about their questions. That will be great. So by a show of hand, who has learned something from me so far? Who has learned something from me? Awesome, thank you. Well, I want to share with you a wealth creation strategy. Did they teach you all this in school? Regular school, did they teach you all this? Not really, nope. right? So the wealth creation strategy was used to be like, you go to school, you get a job, you buy a house, and you pay into a pension. Then you retire happily. Yeah, that's that work anymore. How many of you know some people who work very, very, very hard, but they don't have much money? You know somebody that work really, really hard and they don't have much money, right? How many of you here have a post-secondary degree, like a university, a college degree? Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your, hand, keep your hands up if you have a college degree or post-secondary post -secondary degree. So how many of you are financially free because of your degree? Nobody? That's the major disconnect. So what I want to share with you, for those who are interested, we have a one-day real estate investing online bootcamp coming up on April 29th, Saturday. Six hours presented by me. There you could learn more about different strategies. For example, rent to own, lease options, distressed properties, once again, income properties, some creative financing and raise funds, negotiation skill, how do you negotiate with sellers, and much, much more. 
we will even throw in, throw in an extra bonus session, a two hour bonus session to talk about wholesale and assignment, a strategy that you could start making money without any capital and credit. And also how you could protect all your assets and save on tax on this asset and income protection. The whole bootcamp is only 199.97. We only have limited seats available. So you could go ahead and register for this bootcamp. It's only $200 on this website. By the way, we even have an early bird special for you. If you enroll today, it's only $39.97. So if you enjoy and learn a lot from me today, well, take this bootcamp and you're gonna learn a whole lot more. You're gonna to learn a lot more. So as I see that Lena has put in that link on the chat. So go ahead and register for this one day bootcamp. I know some of you in this room have already taken off our bootcamp or maybe you are already a TYT advanced students. That's great. For those who have never taken our TYT bootcamp yet, this is your time to learn more about real estate investing and how to achieve financial freedom. Before I let you go, I want to share a personal story with you. Now, these are my parents. Both my dad and mom are diagnosed with uh, Parkinson and Alzheimer's disease, both of them. My mom started this 10 years ago and now she cannot really move. My dad started last year. So still in this early stage, but then, as you may know, this disease can be cured. The medication is just for slowing down their deterioration. So as the only child, I have a huge responsibility to take care of them. Two months ago, my dad was diagnosed with liver cancer. And last week, he was sent to the hospital because he had some internal bleeding. And uh, a couple of days ago, one of my good friends asked me, she goes, Stephen, do you have like any regrets dealing with your parents? I thought about it and told her, guess what? No, I don't have any regrets because for the past three years, since I'm financially free, I don't have to go to work. I have spent a lot of my time with my parents during their last stage of their lives. I have even hired three different caretakers taking care of my mom at home. And they're not cheap, it costs me over $12,000 a month. But I don't need to worry about my finance. Now I can spend more time with them every day, every day, and that's priceless. So I have no regrets. And I really put into thoughts like about what, what really a regret is. I find that if you've done what you want and what you're supposed to do, then usually there's no regrets because you have tried it. However, however, most people, most people who have regrets in their life is because they didn't take any action. They haven't done whatever it takes to achieve what they want. And that's what regrets is. And thank you for all the good messages on the chat. Thank you, Miranda. <laughs> thank you for, for all the warm wishes. And that's just my personal story. Before, before I let you go and end this session today, I want to share with you one video, and then we can, we, we'll do one exercise, and then we'll end call it for the day. So let me share with you with one video. Okay, and this video is not too long, a few minutes. And let me pull that out. Give me one second. Here. Um. There are a lot of ways the people around us can help improve our lives. We don't bump into every neighbor, so a lot of wisdom never gets passed on. But we do share the same public spaces. 
So over the past few years, I've tried ways to share more with my neighbors in public space, using simple tools like stickers, stencils, and chalk. And these projects came from questions I had like, how much are my neighbors paying for their apartments? How can we lend and borrow more things without knocking on each other's doors at a bad time? How can we share more of our memories of our abandoned buildings and gain a better understanding of our landscape? And how can we share more of our hopes for our vacant storefronts so our communities can reflect our needs and dreams today? Now, I live in New Orleans, and I am in love with New Orleans. My soul is always soothed by the giant live oak trees, shading lovers, drunks, and dreamers for hundreds of years. And I trust a city that always makes way for music. I feel like every time someone sneezes, New Orleans has a parade. <laughs> the city has some of the most beautiful architecture in the world, but it also has one of the highest amounts of abandoned properties in America. I live near this house, and I thought about how I could make it a nicer space for my neighborhood. And I also thought about something that changed my life forever. In 2009, I lost someone I loved very much. Her name was Joan, and she was a mother to me. And her death was sudden and unexpected. And I thought about death a lot. And this made me feel deep gratitude for the time I've had and brought clarity to the things that are meaningful to my life now. But I struggle to maintain this perspective in my daily life. I feel like it's easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day and forget what really matters to you. So with help from old and new friends, I turned the side of this abandoned house into a giant chalkboard and stenciled it with a fill-in-the-blank sentence, Before I die, I want to... So anyone walking by can pick up a piece of chalk, reflect on their lives, and share their personal aspirations in public space. I didn't know what to expect from this experiment, but by the next day, the wall was entirely filled out, and it kept growing. And I'd like to share a few things that people wrote on this wall. Before I die, I want to be tried for piracy. <laughs> Before I die, I want to straddle the international date line. Before I die, I want to sing for millions. Before I die, I want to plant a tree. Before I die, I want to live off the grid. Before I die, I want to hold her one more time. Before I die, I want to be someone's cavalry. Before I die, I want to be completely myself. So this neglected space became a constructive one, and people's hopes and dreams made me laugh out loud, tear up, uh, and they consoled me during my own tough times. It's about knowing you're not alone, it's about understanding our neighbors in new and enlightening ways. It's about making space for reflection and contemplation and remembering what really matters most to us as we grow and change. And I made this last year and started receiving hundreds of messages from passionate people who wanted to make a wall with their community. So my Civic Center colleagues and I made a toolkit, and now walls have been made in countries around the world, including Kazakhstan, South Africa, Australia, Argentina, and beyond. Together, we've shown how powerful our public spaces can be if we're given the opportunity to have a voice and share more with one another. Two of the most valuable things we have are time and our relationships with other people. In our age of increasing distractions, it's more important than ever to find ways to maintain perspective and remember that life is brief and tender. 
Death is something that we're often discouraged to talk about or even think about, but I've realized that preparing for death is one of the most empowering things you can do. Thinking about death clarifies your life. Our shared spaces can better reflect what matters to us as individuals and as a community. And with more ways to share our hopes, fears, and stories, the people around us can not only help us make better places, they can help us lead better lives. Thank you. So what I want to do now is to invite all of you to start typing in the chat before I die. I. So go ahead and type this in the chat and share with us. What is it that you want to do before you die? To some of you, this could be a difficult exercise. Maybe you have never thought about it. Give this a try. John, thank you. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing. But you're supposed to put in right down before I die. I. Oh, there you go. Before I die, I want to want to see my son thrive as an adult. Awesome. Joe, before I die, I want to see my kids grow into educated investors and have them be financially free. Clement says, before I die, I want to have a child with my wife. Awesome. George, before I die, I want to see the Leafs win a Stanley Cup. Oh, my God. I want to see the Canucks to win the Cup as well. <laughs> Kim says, before I die, I want to retire my parents. Oh, that's lovely. Jereen says, before I die, I want to make my parents proud. Suzanne, before I, want, before I die, I want to find happiness again. Stop house hacking already and help my children buy houses. Miranda and Benny, tell every day that you love your partner. You live, you live him or her and your kids because it can be the last time you can you ever say that. Joe says, never going to happen with the Canucks. What? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your participation today. Hope, hopefully you learned something. And, uh, and of course, your message on the chat right now will also inspire others. And of course, we are here to help. We are here to support you. And if you have further questions about your investing journey, we are here to help. Talk to one of the TYT coaches. Make sure you make an appointment to talk to one of them. And just to wait, remind you that we have some upcoming TYT events and courses. There are some TYT advanced courses going on. The real estate investing financing fundamentals already just started. There's creative financing one starting in April. <clears throat> There's income properties, multi-unit residential. The advanced courses for this, that's going to be in May, and lease options as well. These are in-person live training in Edmonton. And we have some public events open to the public, uh, TYT events. We have the monthly panel, Real Estate Investing and Money Ch Coffee Chats on April 15. TYT Connect in Vancouver, networking events for investors to come out and have a casual chat. That's in Joey Burnaby, 2 to 4 p.m. local time on April 15. We have other basic seminars like this coming up, how to create financial independence in two to five years, and how to build a successful real estate investor power team. That's all, though both are taught by Team Sai. That's on April 19 and April 27. You can find all these events on Eventbrite. Just search for Trust Your Talent events, and you will find them. And register to any of them and make sure you connect with us stay connected trust your talent is on facebook on instagram on youtube you can scan that qr code and 
registered into the Talented Investors Group. It is a private group with over 2,300 active investors. We also have YouTube channel, My Daily Dose with Tim on YouTube. He says he shares a lot of great content. Make sure that if you haven't done so, make sure you watch season two, episode 56, Understanding Real Estate Cycle. That's a great watch. So with that said, thank you very much for attending this seminar today. Hopefully we will see each other in the TYT events. So thank you very much and good night, everyone. Thank you for all the nice messages on the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.